Hi, I'm Hugh Whitmore. Welcome to A Church Without Paul. Before I get started, I'd just like to say, praise and glorify the God of the Bible, because He is the one true God. Today's teaching is entitled, Are Christians Spiritual Beings? And the quick answer is an emphatic yes. And I don't think you Christians really realize how spiritual you are. This is one of my foundational teachings, and in my opinion, the entire Bible rests upon this concept. Not only am I going to show how Christians are spiritual beings, I'm going to show from the scripture that not only does the spiritual energy of God flow to us by the Holy Spirit, but that we send spiritual energy to God. So what I'm going to start with is to go in order. First, I'm going to ask what we can agree on as far as terminology about the spiritual energy in the Bible. Two, then we'll cover what the scripture says. Then we'll take a leap outside of the Bible to show how this teaching is proven by the actions of society and why the teaching sounds a bit like it's from the New Age, but it isn't because it's all from the Bible. But that will weigh on to the proof of this. Then finally, I'll ask the question, if we're as spiritual as I'm going to suggest, why don't we recognize it more and why don't we feel it more? Okay. Oh, and as usual, today's teaching is based on my book, The Moment Time Stopped. If you want to thorough explanation of all the things I teach, not just today's lesson. Okay, so what can we agree on as far as terminology? Do we agree that God is the source of all energy? Let you think that through. I think we would. I would assume so. God is the creator, and no other entity produces energy that we know of from the Bible. Satan doesn't. The angels don't. Just God. He is the creator. God creates all the forces of the world, as a matter of fact, life, the sun, wind and waves, for example. Even the energy that people think man produces, like electricity, is produced you know, usually from burning coal, which is pent-up energy, God's product, his byproduct of his creation. Or it's, it's also electricity is produced by rivers flowing downhill. That's God's energy through the power of gravity. Even nuclear power is just God's pent-up energy in uranium. So I think we can agree that God is the source of all energy. So next, do we agree that God is spirit? I think, again, we could agree on that. God has appeared in flesh, in the flesh, from time to time when he's entered our dimension, but he is primarily spirit and resides in his own spiritual dimension. Here's some scriptures on God as spirit. Genesis 1-2. The Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. This is before creation, when God had not yet transferred his energy into his physical creation. And his spirit, or his energy, was just hovering above the water. This is ex excess power he has. Okay. John 4.24 God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So that's a little bit of hint of where we're going here today, that we'll be worshiping in spirit and truth. But there again, I don't think it takes much persuasion to say that God is spirit and all the energy and creation comes from God. Okay, so what I do in this teaching as we go forward, you'll notice that I often use the word energy to describe all these different words we're going to get to that the Bible uses to describe different forms of God's energy. So it's just a heading. So I hope you don't think I'm going outside the Bible for that. It's just to try to corral them all into one word. Okay, so God is all energy and God is spirit. Do we agree that the spirit has power? I think we would. Ezekiel 11:24. And the spirit lifted me up and brought me in a vision by the spirit of God to the exiles in Chaldea. So in this case, God is giving enough spiritual energy to the prophet Isaiah to lift him up and give him a vision. Micah 3.8, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. That's pretty straightforward, power by the Spirit of the Lord. And when we get to the New Testament, we see how spiritual energy works in Jesus. Luke 8, 45-46, this is the English Standard Version on this quote. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, 
for I perceive that power has gone out from me. So spiritual energy can enter and leave Jesus. And it did so in this case when he was creating a miracle. So keep this in mind as we go along because spiritual energy can also enter and leave God and enter and leave us. All right. Now, can we agree that the visible proof or manifested power of God's spirit or energy is called glory in the Bible? And I think so because there's a lot of places that God's glory is described. Ezekiel 11:22, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain. So that's God's manifested or shown power of his energy called glory. Numbers 14:10. The glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. So the glory of the Lord, his manifested power. That's not God himself. It's his manifested or shown energy. Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So this ties back to how God's glory was an energy, a spirit was hovering over the waters before he transferred his energy to creation, which in the psalm here was what they're describing, is how God's glory, energy, is in his creation. Okay, so I think it's easy to say and know and believe that God's manifested spirit, power, energy is called glory. All right, now are we spirit as believers? Are we spiritual beings? Well, I believe we become spiritual beings when we repent and become baptized. And it does happen. Okay, Ezekiel 11:19. God speaking through the prophet to Israel. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. He's speaking to Israel. So God wants to put a new spirit in Israel because the spirit Israel kept accepting was that of the devil for their whoring with other gods and passing their children through the fire, which was awful, of course. Job 32.8, but there is a spirit in man. That's pretty direct there. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. So that's pretty straightforward. There's a spirit in man. That's us. When Jesus gave advice on how to speak under persecution in Matthew 10.20, he said, For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your Father speaking through you. So this is showing that we are spirit by God's transfer of energy. Another thing you notice from the Bible is how often Jesus drives out unclean spirits because that would be vital because without a clean spirit, you can't really share energy with God because obviously that would break the transmission of that spirit energy. Okay, last one on this, 1 Peter 4.14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That would be the spirit of God's manifested power, glory. And 416, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So this is where we're segueing to how glory can get transferred from us. So we have two things, God's spirit, which is what he retains within him, and his glory, which is the outward manifestation of God's spirit. Peter also indicated that we send glory or spiritual energy to God. So does glorifying God actually mean something physical? Does our spiritual energy actually do anything to add to God's spiritual energy or glory? We'll have to see because that's the main premise of this teaching. And I believe it's the main premise of the entire Bible, this exchange of energy between God and us as his believers. Psalm 29, 1-2, this is the King James Version quoting. King David is speaking, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. So we give him glory, and it strengthens him. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, so David is saying we give God glory, or spiritual energy, and it gives God strength. It's beautiful and very enlightening to know this. In Revelation 4.11, when the elders before the throne worship Jesus, they say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. And that's from the elders. That's not from God. So that is 
somebody that was human form, but now is in heaven, worshiping God around the throne, uh, Jesus around the throne, which you'll see in Revelation in the early chapters. Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. So God's making certain what he does with his glory. He needs to reserve it because he needs to use it, and that's why he needs it from us, which we'll be getting to. He needs that glory to overcome Satan. All right. Oh, Matthew 17, 14 to 17. Jesus removed a demon and cured an epileptic boy that the disciples couldn't cure. And when the disciples asked why, Jesus said in Matthew 17, 21, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So in this case, the spiritual energy we're speaking of is used to heal rather than glorify God. But why does Jesus mention fasting and prayer? It represents God's two-way system of spiritual energy. What happens in a fast? Energy leaves the body, and you can offer up that energy to God. I fast from time to time. I'm not a huge faster. I'll skip a meal every now and then, though, and I, as I do that, I pray and I offer up that energy to God. And then this is why God asks us to fast. And then, of course, with prayer can come the other way. Jesus was saying that with prayer, God would send the Holy Spirit energy back to create the healing. So it's the two-way process again. The Bible has this everywhere. You can look through the Bible now that you're aware of the concept and see it everywhere. That's why I say it's the foundational concept of the entire Bible and how to understand it, this exchange of energy and why God needs it and what he sets up to get it. So you see that glory is a specific type of energy that God needs and uses and that we are required to send him. So to recap, so far we've covered how God is a source of all energy, God is spirit, spirit has power, and God's spiritual energy is called glory. We as believers are spirit, and we give spiritual energy or glory to God, and we're required to. And when you see the Bible, like I said, and you study it, you can see this pattern all the way through. And when you get to how it's beautifully revealed in the glorification of Jesus in John chapter 17, which was just before his death, it's really eye-opening. Okay, one... When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. Jesus is speaking again of this two-way nature of receiving glory and returning it to God. And And in the case of Jesus, this extends to his followers as they interact with God, because Jesus is there as a perfect role model for us as his believers. Verse 2, Since you have given him authority over all flesh, that's Jesus speaking of himself, how God has given him authority over all flesh, to to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So this is Jesus stating that he's been given the task of bringing eternal salvation. And he continues in verse 3. Eternal salvation existed before, but now Jesus is bringing it to all of mankind. All right. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Here Jesus is defining God's method of eternal salvation, which is these things. We repent, a sorrowful repentance, and then we get baptized, at which time we become spiritual beings. We're baptized figuratively, right, into this spiritual nature, which makes us able to receive and send spiritual energy to God. This is the entrance to salvation, not the end as the Paul believers teach. We repent and then we get baptized and we become spiritual beings. But this is where it all starts because after getting saved, we must then enter a physical relationship with God. Not a hello, pat him on the back physical relationship, but where we follow his laws by abstaining from sin. That's physical in nature to withdraw from sin. And by doing righteous works, which again is physical. And these efforts create spiritual energy, which we then offer up to God to glorify Him. So it's not by grace that we're saved. It's by this process of God's eternal salvation, which has these two steps where we enter into spiritual nature, our spiritual nature, and then we enter into the physical relationship. And you know, God loved us enough to create this method for us to earn our way out of this sinful world. And in return, 
If we do it correctly and adequately and strongly enough with enough love and fervor, God becomes glorified to the point where he can do his job, which is to overcome Satan and send Jesus back. Because we have, it's like a partnership we have with God. It's a spiritual agreement with God as believers, an individual covenant with him. And that's the nature of what changed from the salvation offered to Israel in the Old Testament and the later salvation Jesus brought to everyone, to the Gentiles. It used to be a group salvation for Israel alone. If you recall from John 4.22, Jesus said salvation was of the Jews originally, but then it opened up to everybody. God changed it to an individual salvation. Same salvation, though, because it's eternal. And God hinted at this change to be coming even in the Old Testament, long before it happened in Jeremiah 31, 29 and 30. In those days, they shall no longer say the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, but everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. So it was the same plan of eternal salvation. It just now opened up to anyone on an individual basis. This is confirmed throughout the New Testament. Jesus said in John 4, 23, you worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. I already quoted that. But the hour is coming and is now here. This is where Jesus is moving the faith. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, that's us as spiritual beings worshiping in spirit, and truth, truth being the physical side of the relationship, the word we obey. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. He was no longer seeking this group because he had to finally reject the Jews because they had rejected him. And eternal salvation was going to die if he didn't pass it on and have it fulfilled by us, his believers. We fulfill eternal salvation, not just for ourselves, but for God. And we'll be getting to exactly what that means as we go along here. Jesus made this certain, this transfer to individuals, to the Gentiles, in Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore, that must be King James Version, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's teaching all nations, outside of just Israel now. This is one more reason that Paul was not needed, because the Gentiles had already been grafted in by Jesus. Plus, Peter was sent to lead the Gentiles by his words in Acts 15, 7. Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth, this is Peter speaking, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So Paul, Paul made that up about being the one chosen to <laughs> graft in the Gentiles. His, his testimony was false, and he did a lot of puffery, a lot of talk, to make himself look like an elevated spiritual being that he tried to pass off. Anyway, so with the coming of the gospel, we move from the law of Moses to the law of Jesus, which James called the perfect law of liberty in James 1.25, but it was the same salvation, and Jesus in verse 4 repeats the method. Continuing with Jesus speaking to God, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. This is an acknowledgement of the direct links between how works create glory or spiritual energy to God. That's what you're doing when you evangelize or you, you, know, you preach to somebody or you run your family in a godly way or you abstain from sin. It's creating all this glory for God. It's really a beautiful concept nobody teaches. It's great to understand this and to dig into it and really revolve your faith life around it. You know, Jesus is a model for us in, in speaking these ways. God could have sent himself. He could have come down and brought salvation the second time to the Gentiles, but he sent Jesus. And God had 4,000 years of history of appearing in person to Israel. And even with all of that, they rejected him. We have God in the distance. He's in our hearts, but he's in a distance. But we believe in him so much. That's why it's so powerful what the remnant is going to do for God and how just a few of us are going to make this thing happen in the end. Oh, but God sent Jesus in human form to be a living example of his method of salvation. And we still have that image in our minds when we read the gospel. So I have to admit that a big problem with this teaching, and I touch on this in a lot of my teachings, but I wanted to sort of consolidate it here. But 
People will ask why God would need our spiritual energy. Because, as a matter of fact, Paul reiterates this doubt. Because in Acts 17.25, Paul said of God, Nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. So I hope you're warming up to this teaching, because this is where Paul purposefully damages God where he says that God is not served by human hands, which is exactly what glorifying God by our works does. And Paul uses God's creation as a reason to believe God doesn't need us to serve him. But there's a difference between the energy God used up in his physical creation and his need for glory to overcome the devil, which are two different things. God is evident by his creation. You have to say that. But God, after his spirit was hovering over the waters, it went in his spirit, energy went into the earth and the creation. So a lot of God's energy is tied up in his creation. And that's why he needs our glory to worship him, to glorify him, so that he increases in power, as David said, give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Okay. And the proof of why God needs our glory has to do with this age of sin we're living in and how it relates to salvation. And Jesus gets to that in this continuing verse in John. Verse 4, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So Jesus is mentioning different times. And this is just an amazing thing to me. Because what Jesus is doing is addressing the three ages of time in the history of God's creation and as to how they relate to sin. Jesus tells us, He was glorified before creation in the first age, not glorified in the current age after creation and the invention of sin. And that would make sense because Jesus didn't appear in the Old Testament. And now he's being glorified again by God in the New Testament to usher in the third and final age. So to clarify, the three ages of time are, as it relates to salvation, first, prior to and just after creation, where there was perfection and eternity because there was no sin. So a method of salvation wasn't needed. If there's no sin, no method of obtaining salvation is required because there was nothing to bring spiritual death. God was perfectly sovereign in that period, the first age. Okay, then the second age we're in, that we're in now, started when sin was created by Satan. And I've said this many times that Satan created sin because I just don't think God created sin. I don't believe God created sin because 1 John 1 5 says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So I don't think God created sin. I think that was a creation of Satan. And it's just a theft. What does sin do? Well, Satan's a thief, as I just said. And the sin energy steals God's glory because humans were invented to worship God. And all of them were worshiping God and giving him glory before sin. But then suddenly most humans stop worshiping God because sin is so pleasurable. So God's glory was greatly reduced and Satan is becoming glorified now by all these sinners. And so what did God do to attempt to overcome his lack of being sovereign and to earn his kingdom back? Because he isn't sovereign in this period. He created his method of eternal salvation to try to get his believers to glorify him adequately to overcome the devil. Then we're waiting for the third and final age which is when God will return to being completely sovereign, when Jesus returns with the kingdom. This is why Jesus said in Revelation twenty-two thirteen, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The Alpha and the Omega are the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. And Jesus goes on to say, the first and the last, speaking of himself. The beginning and the end. And Jesus was present and fully glorified in the beginning, the Alpha, was not glorified in the middle, the age we're in now, and then we'll be glorified in the end by our efforts, the omega, the last, the beginning and the end. Okay. So in our age, because of sin, God's glory or spiritual energy is diminished. Christians don't like to hear this because they want to believe God is all-powerful and perfectly sovereign, but God is not all-powerful and perfectly sovereign in this middle age of the three we're stuck in, and that's why he needs our spiritual glory. Now, what will come in the third and final age, as predicted by Jesus in Matthew 24 and as depicted in the book of Revelation, is that God becomes perfectly sovereign, but it hasn't happened yet 
because sin is too great and not enough Christians follow God's rules of eternal salvation because they're trapped in Paul's false testimony of grace, which pulls them away from the physical relationship needed to give God glory. Jesus encourages believers to believe in the power of their spiritual nature and their ability to glorify God in John 10, 34-35. Is it not written in your law, I said, you are God's? This refers to the fact that we are spiritual beings. Jesus said, you are God's. That was an Old Testament quote that he's reiterating in the New Testament. And the word God in this quote has a small g to show our limited spiritual nature. Obviously, we're not huge gods or the God, but this is nothing to run from as a Christian. Once we repent and become baptized, we are little gods which elevates us just a bit from our fully human status as it relates to the ability to glorify God. Jesus goes on in Luke 17, 20 to 21, and this is the King James Version. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It's within us because it's ours to create by our works in this age of sin. And Jesus is also saying you can't see it. It's not by observation. We won't be able to see it happening around us. And that was for people looking for a sign. Because we will be making it happen by our actions. As we, as a church, become physically involved with creating the kingdom by our works that glorify God. What a beautiful sentiment and what a beautiful thing to encourage you in your faith life. And your life of doing works for God. You know, at the core of this teaching is that God needs us. What a beautiful thought. And doesn't that make perfect sense? God is infinitely loving by his nature. He's our father and he's a jealous God. And that just doesn't mean that he's jealous and will punish us when we transgress. He will. We do fear God. But that he's jealous for our love, which is given by our works as we lovingly follow his commands of eternal salvation. So, if you've agreed with the teaching so far that God is energy and God is spirit and the spirit has power and that God's manifested energy is called glory and that we as believers are spirit and we give glory to God to strengthen him, I'll explain now how the new age, ironically, helps to prove what I've said today and proves the existence of God and then why even though we're spiritual beings, we don't feel it as much as you think we might or as they did in the New Testament. Okay, this story starts back when I found out Paul was false and that the Bible had many contradictions in it. And it really shook my faith for a while, but I love God and I promised him I would never forsake him. So I dug in deeper to seek the truth, given what I worried at the time was that the Bible was an unreliable text. Oh, since then I've corrected this impression, because I know the Bible is reliable for finding the truth if you learn to see it from the story level, and that's why Jesus taught in stories, or parables as they're called, and why I always teach that you should try to see the Bible as a novel, because it is one story from beginning to end. And then you could stay at the story level, and these truths of God will come to you more readily. Okay, so I was searching for proof of God because my faith was shaken. I knew God and Jesus had both appeared to believers in the Bible, but they aren't here today. And I also didn't see the powerful manifestations of God's Holy Spirit, His glory, as described in the Bible. And so I was looking for that. And I also didn't see the powerful manifestations of God's Holy Spirit described in the Bible. For example, Mark 16, 17 and 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And these powers are confirmed in Mark 16.20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. In Acts 2.2, at the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in a rush, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And these were real languages, not the gibberish you hear today in these phony churches, because the chapter there in Acts goes on to describe 17 different languages being spoken and understood by people from all over that region. 
Acts 5.15, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that the least that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by them might overshadow some of them. That's amazing. The shadow of Peter could heal people of sickness. And this rivals some of the powers, the spiritual powers of Jesus. Peter healing people by his shadow, wow. But by use of the Spirit alone, Peter even caused the death of two people, Ananias and his wife, because the couple sold a possession and they promised to give the money to the church, but they held some back. And they were caused, their death, their death was caused by the Spirit. Peter also brought a dead woman named Dorcas back to life in Acts 9. 36 to 43. So back to my story, I saw no powerful manifestations of God as were depicted in the Bible, and I was seeking proof of God, and I did have an awareness that society is structured in such a manner as to systematically deny the truth of God in the Bible. So I took some time to look at the patterns of society again. And I started with the false religions, and then I got to the New Age, which is a false religion, and I saw similarities where they all take some teachings of our God our God, to draw people away from the Bible, to make it sound familiar, but then they move their followers away from the most important thing in our faith, which is the method of eternal salvation offered to us by the one true God. And they move you onto the left-hand path, which is what the occult calls it. It's nothing to do with politics left and right, but it's a mocking of how Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, and, but they call it the left-hand path. And because that's what the false religions do. They counterfeit God and mock his Christ. And this creates glory for Satan. So when I focused on the New Age, which isn't a single religion, but it's more of a smorgasbord of left-hand path spirituality. And I saw that energy plays a significant role in the New Age. For example, they usually won't admit to the type of God we have. But they do sometimes use that word God, but more around what they refer to as a source of creation that's pure energy. And sometimes they call it a God, you know, but not the God. They're not going to tilt that way at all because their job is to pull people away from the Bible. And the New Age is one of the biggest places where people get pulled out of the Bible because they get into the Bible. They see that it's not all true. They see false things in Paul and how it sets up these arguments. And then they move away and they want to be spiritual and they go to the New Age. You know, but the New Age then uses this drawing people away to sort of hint at God. And sometimes they call Jesus an ascended master. But they refer to this energy of creation as source or source energy. So they have a sort of a godly concept and they draw you away into a, a false belief. Okay. And also, they really focus their lives around this source energy. They use crystals and pyramids to draw energy from the source. They contact spirit beings. They do astral projection, which is training your soul to travel around in the spirit. They believe in a higher self, whereby if you tap into source energy, you'll become spiritually elevated. They believe in evolution, which as a theory requires an ever-increasing amount of energy in the universe, or as the scientists say, there's an ever-increasing amount of information being added to the gene pool, which mocks God's perfect creation. It's already perfected. Evolution is a fake. They also believe in the New Age that they can be one with this source of energy, and all mankind can share this source of oneness, and that they can achieve God consciousness, and that the ultimate destination is to be one with God. You've probably heard all these trite sayings of theirs. Anyway, the first thing I noticed was that the oneness of man concept in the New Age was from the Bible, because Jesus did say believers can all be one spiritually in John 17, 21. That they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So spiritual oneness and the concept of God being energy and the belief that they can become gods in sharing spiritual energy have been stolen from the Bible. And this theft is clever. Satan took the idea that God is energy from the Bible and that people can become gods and that people can be one with God and with each other, twisted these godly concepts into a mocking of the one true God, put it in the New Age religion, and a few hundred million people now follow it.
So when I teach it to you by showing it to you in the Bible, many of you recoil because it sounds like I'm teaching you the new age and luring you away from God's eternal salvation. So let me repeat the logic. The reason my teaching today, which is right from the Bible, sounds like it's from outside the Bible, is because it's been stolen from the Bible and put in a popular false religion so that Christians won't accept the teaching because it's taught outside the Bible in a false religion. That's pretty slick. I mean, only Satan could be that slick, right? He's even slicker, as I'm getting to here. Okay. Soon after my New Age discovery and all of its thefts from the one true God, I found out that Paul was false about that same time. And I realized the pattern of Paul's falseness had the same effect as the New Age and the other false religions. But Paul's falseness was instituted backwards because in the Bible, we receive the truth of God's eternal salvation first in the Old Testament. And then Jesus comes, he changes it a little bit and adds baptism and it's opened up to the Gentiles. But it's still eternal salvation. And then you get to Paul, if you're reading through the Bible, this is why the Bible as a novel is written that way, to lead you to a certain conclusion, because nefarious people put Paul in there. And then you reach Paul after learning about eternal salvation, and he turns believers away from the eternal salvation with a counterfeit version of grace that blasphemes God and mocks Messiah Jesus. And this is taking place right inside the Bible, which is the biggest scam in the history of the world. And that's why sometimes it pays in, first of all, taking a look at the Bible like a novel, getting the story level, but then looking outside the Bible at society, at the story level, at the metadata, where all the things that are going on and all these patterns you see. And Paul fits the pattern. That's why people who argue with me about Paul, I say often, it isn't just the enormous case against him you can find in the Bible, it's that Paul fits the profile. He is false in the way that the entire world sets up falseness to steal from the one true God and his Messiah. So, you know, Paul, he's just like the other false religions. And he, Paul, and they, the false religions, gave me the proof that, of God that I was searching for. Because all of these systematic methods of denying the eternal salvation of the one true God and the mocking of his Christ are duplicated in every corner of society like politics, business, sports and entertainment, and they are the greatest current physical manifestations that God is real and Jesus is Messiah because it's energy used by the devil that he receives from his worshipers, his glory, his energy, is going to these mockings to set up this whole society because why would society do this? all around the world if God weren't real and Jesus weren't Messiah. They, they wouldn't. They wouldn't need to. And Satan's using up all his glory doing that. You know, you don't go to a Buddhist country and see a systematic societal apparatus set up against Buddha. You don't go to Islamic countries and see a systematic societal apparatus set up against Islam. But you see this systematic apparatus set up against the one true God everywhere in the world, which proves God is real in an age where proof is impossible to find based on the way the Bible teaches us these powerful manifestations that we don't see. So what does Satan get for all of this clever infiltration? By this worldwide ritual of denying God and Jesus, he creates glory. He gets to steal from God that's due to God. And by this power, he denies God his sovereign rule of his own kingdom. So the main way to understand the glorification of Satan is in Luke 4, 5, and 6, where Jesus is tempted by Satan. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. So you see, God is not glorified by this world, because it's not his. That's why he created a salvation for his believers that is opposite of the sinful world, one which is defined by the absence of sin. Wow, and this, and, this, and this salvation denies Satan his glory and instead glorifies God. That's our salvation. So that's why it's so vital we pursue this teaching. We're in this period of time when God isn't sovereign. The world, as in the biblical definition of it, which means sin, the things of the flesh, and the temporary pleasures glorify Satan. 
And why was the world delivered to Satan? Because he possesses enough glory or spiritual energy from the worship of his followers to control it. And we have to outdo him. That's our task. That's our mission. That's how we glorify God and we'll bring back Jesus. And this is the battle raging over our heads. And you just have to understand that we are the warriors. And how do we do it? Well, anything that you do that, was, that is within God's method of eternal salvation will glorify him. Confess your sorry repentance and get baptized to become a spiritual being, that small g God. Then enter into the physical relationship with God that includes actions that glorify him. Abstain from sin. And just being in the state of abstinence is so powerful because Satan gets no glory and God gets all the glory. Any of your righteous works will help. Spreading the gospel of the kingdom, fasting and prayer. And I believe the scripture teaches us that there's great glory in verbalizing your transfer of energy to God because we are commanded to confess our faith. As it says in 1 John 4, 2, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit... That's us that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. That's not mysticism. That's not the New Age. That's not Gnosticism. That's right out of the mouth of Messiah Jesus. And Jesus also said in Matthew 10, 32, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. These confessions create worship energy. God needs to send Jesus back. So the final question here of this long teaching is that if we are spiritual beings, why don't we have evidence of it on the same level of intensity there, as there was during and shortly after the time of Jesus? One of my teaching positions is that the Holy Spirit has not been active since Paul's false testimony killed the physical relationship believers have with God that creates the glory necessary to empower him to send Jesus back and return to the final age of creation where God is completely sovereign. Once again, most Christians repent they become baptized, they become spiritual beings, and they have the kingdom inside of them, and they are little gods. But then they believe in Paul's false testimony, which keeps them from entering into the physical relationship that God needs from us to glorify him and give him the spiritual energy to bring Jesus back. On top of this lack of physical effort, those who believe in Paul believe falsely. So they send their glory to Satan and mock God by denying his method of eternal salvation. It's my deeply held belief that if enough of us return to the kingdom teachings of Jesus, throw off the chains of Paul, and use our spiritual energy to glorify the Father, then God will be fully glorified and we will feel the power of the Holy Spirit filling us up and we will be as powerful as the disciples were in the Bible. We'll be given the full gifts of the Holy Spirit. We'll know for sure that God is with us and within us. And we'll share that amongst us, just like the Bible says. And the gospel of this kingdom will be preached all throughout the world. And then the end will come and we'll be together in eternity with God and with Jesus. We are in this fight for God. And it's up to us. The battle is ours to win or lose. The kingdom is within us. Praise and glorify God. Remember what King David said. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let's bring back the kingdom of our Lord and Savior so we can live in peace forever.